Last week, that is the triumphant entry of Christ, the Palm Sunday, I preached a message I titled, The Savior Comes. And on Good Friday, I preached the sermon, The Savior Dies. And today, I talk about the Savior lives. The one who came, the one who died, is alive. And uh, we want to just look into the scriptures to look at the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and we want to examine it briefly uh, before we partake of communion today. We know the story of the redemption, of, of the resurrection. We know it, we've read it many times in the Bible, and uh, especially during Easter, uh, we read from all the Gospels and what they said about uh, the resurrection of Christ. But I'm not going to take you to the Gospel accounts, I'm going to take you to the book of Acts, to the first sermon that was preached by the apostles or disciples of Jesus uh, after his resurrection. And the reason why this is very important to me is because this is the first message the church is preaching. And if you would know anything about the disciples, um, when they went into Jerusalem and, and Judas betrayed Jesus, they were thrown off. Uh, in the Garden of Gethsemane, they didn't know how to react when they saw people come to take Jesus. And when he was taken to trial, their leader, uh, Peter, uh, didn't have the boldness to even stand for Jesus Christ. He denied him three times. And then as Jesus was sentenced, all the disciples scattered. Now you have to understand the disciples had come from Galilee. Galilee is a village. And they are now in Jerusalem and all these major things are taking place and they didn't know how to respond. They're scared. They're scared for their lives. They're scared for their future. And then Jesus dies on the cross. So that probably shut down their confidence and their dreams. Then Jesus resurrects and he stays with them for 40 days. And he tells them that something great is going to happen on the day of Pentecost, which is about 10 days afterwards, after his ascension. And, and something miraculous happens. And so people come to Look at these disciples who had spent all the time after Jesus' death locked away for fear. And they come out boldly to preach. So something powerful has happened to them. And so let's listen to the first message that Peter preached. Acts chapter 2, verse 22 to 24. Men of Israel... Hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves also know. Him, being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God, you have taken by lawless hands, have crucified and put to death, whom God raised up, having lost the pains of death because it was impossible that he should be held by it. What would make people who are so afraid, timid? Peter, who cannot answer to a little girl whether he knew Jesus, three times he says, I don't know this man. The disciples who are locked up couldn't even go to Golgotha or to Calvary to see the crucifixion. And even when the resurrection was reported to them, they couldn't believe it. What gave Peter and the apostles such confidence that they would come out into Jerusalem, not their native Galilee, but come out into Jerusalem and preach with such confidence? They had seen something, they've experienced something, it has been so real to them that it transformed them 
forever. And that's what I want to talk about. I want to talk about the three important proofs that these disciples encountered that changed their lives. And it is their witness that we believe in now to be saved. Because we were not there 2,000 years ago. But if we watch the manner of life of those who were there, we can believe that something miraculous happened and they staked their lives on it. There are three proofs of the resurrection I want to talk about. The first one is what I call the physical evidence. The physical evidence. There was something that happened physically for them that convinced them Jesus was alive. And the first physical evidence was that the tomb was empty, an empty tomb. The tomb in which Jesus Christ was laid, buried, was empty. And that was the first thing. The women who went to the tomb saw it was empty. Peter and John followed later. And the tomb was empty. There was nobody there. Now, of course, some people can say, okay, uh, you know, uh, his body was stolen. Or, you know, thieves came to steal his body. I mean, the, an empty tomb doesn't prove much. It just means the dead body is not there. It's like you, you go into the place where uh, you probably buried a loved one and just get up in Ghana and, and the tomb is empty. I don't think you would conclude that he's resurrected because we know there are grave thieves in Ghana. And, and, and so you may say, well, somebody stole the body. Uh, so the empty tomb is a physical evidence, but it's not conclusive because anything can create an empty tomb. But in addition to the empty tomb, there was something very peculiar that John records that the grave clothes that was used to wrap Jesus Christ was left folded neatly. The head part is in the head place and the other part of the body, uh, the grave clothes for the other part of the body was neatly in place. So that's the second thing, a set of folded grave clothes. Now, what do we make of this? The tomb is empty. The grave clothes in place. Well, if thieves stole his body, I don't think thieves would take the time and say, you know, after we've stolen the body, let's take time, fold the clothes very nicely and leave everything in place. It's like a thief who comes to your house, unfortunately, sadly, it will never happen, but steals uh, something from you, maybe steals a TV set or steals something, and say, after that, let's put the carpet in place. Uh, please arrange the furniture, everything in place before we leave. No thief does that. They are in a hurry. They want to do a quick job. If it was thieves who stole the body, they wouldn't have time to fold the napkin. What if the Romans took the body. Of course, if the Romans took the body, they wouldn't leave any evidence behind that he was even here. They would take everything with them. What if the disciples did it? If the disciples also stole his body, they would not leave the grave clothes. They'll be in a hurry. They'll pick everything, the body with the grave clothes, because they'll consider everything precious to them that they need to, to hold on to as relics of Jesus' death, and they would have picked all together. So the folded grave clothes proves that the, yes, the tomb is empty, but something very unusual has happened in this place. The grave clothes are still in place. Couldn't be thieves, couldn't be Romans. Of course, disciples who say, it's not us. So somebody else took the body. But the empty tomb and the for the grave clothes only prove one thing. It proves absence. It proves absence. It doesn't prove presence. It just proves he's not here. Like the angel says, come and look, he's not here. Yeah, he's not here, but where is he? So the second proof. 
The second proof is what I call the personal experiences or personal encounters. Jesus did not just prove the absence of the body, but he now has to prove the presence of the body. That which is absent from the grave is present somewhere else. And where is it present? It's present before the people. So Jesus says, well, you didn't find me in a grave, but as we'll say these days, the kids will say, ta-da, here I am. I'm absent there, I am present here. And he showed himself to the women, showed himself to the disciples, actually showed himself to them when the doors were locked, telling them that he can go through physical barriers, explaining why the grave clothes could still be there when he was away, that he can now go through things. He has a body, a glorified body that can go through things. So what are the physical encounters? Three major things that Jesus did in his physical encounters. First is that they saw him. Jesus showed himself to his disciples. They saw him as clearly as any person could be seen. Of course, you know, I mean, this is 2,000 years ago. If, if Jesus Christ or somebody came up and says, I'm alive and you see him, you wonder, is it a holograph or hologram, they say? It. Is it a hologram? Is it, is it, is it uh, some play of light? What is going on? You've seen it, but is it real? So they saw him, and Jesus anticipated their thinking. Maybe they think they are seeing a ghost, because in their time, a ghost would be the most conclusive uh, argument that, oh, yeah, we see him, but, you know, it was his ghost. Then he started talking. So he didn't just, they didn't just see him, they spoke with him. They spoke with him. There's a personal encounter. They see his body, and they speak with him. And not only do they speak with him, they ask him questions and he answers. He asks them questions and they answer. So there is a dialogue. It's not like the spirit came then to say, I am I'm alive and I'm alive forevermore. I'm the king of kings and then the Lord of God. That's a computer programming. No, that's not what is happening. He's asking them questions. He says, look at me, give me something to eat. And they give him something and he eats it in front of them, puts it in his mouth. Just to let them know this is not a hallucination. And not only did they speak with him, they touched him. They touched him. They touched his body. They touched his wounds. They touched the wounds in his hands, in his side. They walked with him. They ate with him. I don't know about you, but if you have these three experiences with anybody, you will conclude they are real. If you see a person, and you, you speak with a person, the person speaks to you, you have a conversation, and afterwards you sit and eat with a person and touch the person and feel his body, you're going to conclude he's alive, he's real. There is no ghost story I know so far in African law where uh, somebody says, I saw my grandmother and uh, I saw her and she spoke with me and we talked back and we ate. And I touched the body. No. We just said that he spoke in the, through his nose or her nose. <laughs> it was white. You know, yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's, it, that's not it. This is not a ghost story. This is you see, you talk with a person, you touch the person, you eat with the person. There is nothing spiritual about it. This is real human encounter. This is a physical encounter. That's the second evidence. So after they've had this, they've seen the absence, they've seen the presence. They are bold. Now they know he's alive. And he stays with them 
speaks to so many of them to the extent of speaking to 500 people at a time somewhere in Galilee on a mountain. So this is not a story shared by just two people, three people, four people. Maybe the 12, you say, ah, they were his people, they, he's bribed them or whatever it is. But there are so many people. And one of the reasons why the resurrection stories of the Bible is so compelling more than any argument against the resurrection, one of the most compelling is the real, realness of the story. I mean, if Peter was, was manufacturing a story, he wouldn't say that he doubted. He would say, I was the first person to believe. The disciples would say they were the first to believe. But the Bible says even when the women reported to them, they didn't believe it. And in Jewish society at the time of Jesus Christ, women's testimony was not received in court. Women, sorry. Women's rights was not there. So if you are manufacturing a story to show how compelling it is, you would not say some women were the first to come and tell us. You would, you would, you would get better witnesses. But they said the women said it. Why? Because that is what happened. They were not making it up. It is what happened. The women were the first witnesses. Although in their society, that was not a convincing proof. But they were bound to tell the story as it happened. And the stalwarts didn't believe, but the women believed first. No masculine Jew of the first century will tell such a story. Because this was a patriarchal society. And you will not let women take the lead in such a very powerful story of your belief system. The only conclusion you can get is that it happened as they recorded it. They couldn't change the story, including their doubts, their unbeliefs, their fears, their anxieties. It's all recorded. Peter's denial, all recorded. They didn't Photoshop it. This is it. Third, proof, is the powerful effect it had on the people. The continuing effect of the resurrection, the impact on the early church, the work of the Holy Spirit. As Jesus promised, the Holy Spirit came. So that sermon of Peter is a proof that there is something remarkable had happened in the intervening period between the time when he was in the, in the courtyard denying Jesus and this 50 days later, boldly saying, this is the Christ. And he died and was resurrected. What happened within that time? They had conclusive evidence that Jesus was alive. And more than that, they had the power of the Holy Spirit, whom Jesus promised would be with them. He says, I will be with you always. Now they knew he was with them. So on the day of Pentecost, they stood up and blurted out, he is alive. You know, many times uh, people who oppose Christianity say, oh, this story of the resurrection was made up later. But it is present in the first sermon recorded in the New Testament that the apostles preach. It's not like in Acts chapter 20. It's not like later on in Acts. It's right there. First message preach. He's alive. And they preached he's alive for the rest of their lives. And when they preached that message, it cost them their lives. It cost them. They were beheaded. They were thrown into jail. They were eaten by lions. But none of them changed their story. I don't know about you, but I mean, if you cook up a story and the story is not working and now they are killing us, your wife is being killed, your children are being killed right in front of you, you are being beheaded, you say, hey, by the way, we didn't think this would go this far. We, we were just trying to encourage ourselves, you know, we didn't think it would be this bad. So please, just let me tell you the truth. The man, he didn't resurrect. I mean, that, that's, a, that's, that's a normal thing. 
But almost all the 11 apostles of Jesus died as martyrs. That means they were brutally killed for preaching. Almost all the people who were there at that time, probably all the 500, suffered one way or the other because of this truth. Nobody can manufacture a lie and die for it. One person can do that, but 500 people will not do that. One of them will break ranks. But the story and the evidence of Christianity is that everybody who saw what happened and received the power of the Holy Spirit maintained their witness that Jesus is alive. And by far, the biggest evidence that Jesus rose from the dead is in the transformed lives of those who believe in him. In the transformed lives of the women who were bold. In the transformed life of Peter, who was timid 50 days earlier, couldn't stand a girl questioning him, and now boldly standing in the public square in Jerusalem announcing Jesus is alive. It's in the transformed life of all the disciples. Is in the transformed life of a person like Paul who hated Jesus so much that he has special permission to destroy everything belonging to Jesus who has an encounter with this man he hates and now comes to say he is alive. I've seen him too and be a great disciple of Jesus. It's in your transformed life. It's in my transformed life. You want the evidence that Jesus Christ is alive? I am the evidence because his spirit is in me and he transforms me and makes me a brand new person. Today when we say that our faith is based on the resurrection, we are not lying to ourselves. We are telling the truth based on the evidence that is before us. And this morning before we partake of communion, if you are here this morning, you say, Pastor, I, I, I want to, Jesus to also come into my heart. You know, because one, one thing about living in a society like Ghana is we hear the gospel preach. We hear preaching for so long that we think because we've had preaching for so long, Christ is in us. But you can hear it for so long. You can even be in church for so long and never truly receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and personal Savior. So before we partake of communion today, I want to lead you into a very simple prayer for you to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and your personal Savior. Let's bow down our heads for a moment as we contemplate these words. If you are here and you say, Pastor, I want Jesus to transform my life. I believe he's alive, but I just don't want him just to be alive out there. I want him to be alive inside of me. He lives in me. He must live inside of me. He must be my Lord, my Savior, my resurrected one. And if that's your prayer, that's your desire this morning, just want to pray with you that you make that big decision to make Jesus Christ the Lord of your life. And if you want to make that decision, you want to invite Jesus to come and live inside of you, just lift up your right hand wherever you are. Lift up your hand, lift up your hand, lift up your hand. Let your hand go up. The ushers want to see you, we want to see you, that you are making that decision, and we want to help you to live the Christian life. Just let your hand go up. God bless you as you lift up your hand. God bless you as you lift up your hand. Ushers, let's be quick about it. Note everybody with a hand lifted up. The ushers are going to give you a form, and after you've received it, you can put your hand down. Those of you who lifted up your hand, I want you to put your hand on your chest. All of us, let's do that. Put your hand on your heart. Somebody says, Pastor, why should we do that? It's just to show that what you're about to do, you mean it and you, you are sincere about it. And let's pray this prayer together. Say with me, Heavenly Father, I come to you today just as I am. I am a sinner. I cannot save myself. I thank you, Father that Jesus Christ came, died, and resurrected 
because of me. And I receive him into my heart, into my life, as my Lord and personal Savior. And I thank you for the gift of salvation, which I now receive in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. God bless you. If you pray that prayer for the first time, something remarkable has happened to you. Jesus, who resurrected, now lives inside of you. And just as he transformed the lives of the apostles in the past, he's still transforming lives today. And he's making people better people for the glory of God and for the kingdom of God. And may you live a fruitful Christian life. Please fill the forms that were given to you. When it's time for us to receive the offering, you can put it in the offering basket. And if you are not able to do that, you can fill it and hand it in at the front desk at the lobby. And uh, we will follow you up and help you to live the Christian life. May the Lord help you to truly serve the Lord Jesus Christ all the days of your life. Amen. Thank you.